So continuing with our series on the life of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, Asirat Nabawiya. In the last couple of sessions, we talked about the boycott in the Shu'ab of Abi Talib, the three years of isolation and boycott, and the aftermath of that. I wanted to take a little bit of a, a step back um, to the uh, time when actually the boycott was uh, annulled, when it was canceled, because there were, I, I talked a little bit about how the general sentiment in Mecca started to grow very negative towards this boycott, and how a whole group of people basically protested. Abu Talib kind of took that opportunity and Abu Talib stood up and spoke and then basically told them go and check the uh, the scroll on which the boycott, the agreement was written and they found that miracle that the Prophet ﷺ had informed them of. Um, but I had talked a little bit about, very vaguely, I had spoken about how a group of people from Mecca, the Meccans themselves started to protest against this. And I wanted to kind of elaborate on that a little bit more because that's going to work into the theme of uh, the next few events that we're going to talk about here from the seerah, the life of the Prophet ﷺ. So in that situation where that protest occurred for ending the boycott, Ibn Ishaq rahimahullah ta'ala mentions that there were a few people who actually started to campaign even outside of that one gathering. It wasn't just that at that one moment a bunch of people stood up and said, yeah, absolutely, this boycott is wrong, we need to end this now. No, there was actually a little bit of a movement. There was campaigning that was going on in Mecca among some very, very influential people. Amongst their names, it mentions that a few different people started to get together and started to recruit others to basically go out there, gather some support, and then basically state a case against this boycott and why this boycott needs to end. One of the first ones that's mentioned in this particular uh, situation is a man by the name of I need to actually just find, there's a lot of different names here, but so it mentions a man by the name of Hisham, that this man named Hisham, he actually goes to a very famous leader of Makkah of Quraysh by the name of Zuhair. Um, and this was a very influential man, Zuhair bin Abi Umayyah bin al Mughira. He, this man named Hisham goes to Zuhair and he says, Ya Zuhair, aqad radita an ta'kula ta'am wa talbisa thiyab wa tankiha nisa wa akhwaluka haythu qada alimta la yuba'un wa la yubta'u minhum wa la yankihun wa la yunkahu ilayhim. He goes, Zuhair, you're a decent man. You're a good man. Are you telling me that you're okay with the fact that you continue to eat food and wear good clothes and interact with people and do business and enjoy family and everything else that life in Mecca brings you? When you know that your own uncles, and he calls them uncles because these were still the Banu Hashim, the Banu Abdul Muttalib, the Prophet ﷺ and his family members were from the Quraysh, they were family members. And so he goes, your own uncles, people that are related to you by blood, are going through what they're going through? Are you telling me you're okay with this? And so this, the man named Zuhayr basically tells him, he goes, no, absolutely not. I'm, I'm not okay with this. He says, but what am I supposed to do? He refers to Abu Jahl. Abu al-Hakam is so insistent upon this, maintaining this course of action. So he goes, how are we supposed to stand up against, um, against a man like Abu Jahl, Abu al-Hakam, and all the influence that he has on all the people that he has with him? We're going to need somebody else with us. And he says, فَقَالَ لَهُ زُهَيْرٌ أَبْغِنَا ثَالِثًا We need to find the third person. We need to grow our numbers of this little party that we have. So the narration mentions that they basically then go to Mut'im bin Adi. Now, Al-Mut'im bin Adi is a very interesting person who will play a very pivotal role later on in the seerah, and we'll talk a little bit more about him. But he ends up, he comes up in the seerah again. 
So they go to Mut'am bin Adi and they say the same exact, same exact thing. أَقَدْ رَضِيتَ أَنْ يُهْلِكَ بَطْنَانِ مِنْ بَنِي عَبْدِ مُنَافِ وَأَنْتَ شَاهِدٌ عَلَى ذَلِكَ مُوَافِقٌ لِقَرَيْشٍ فِي He goes, Mut'am, are you saying that you're okay with witnessing two entire families? He's talking about Banu Abdul Muttalib and some people from Banu, Banu Hashim, that two entire extended families, what we call in Urdu like khandans, two extended families being completely wiped out, and you're just gonna stand by and watch this happen? You'll be a witness to such an atrocity? You're telling me a decent good man like you is okay with this? He goes, absolutely not, I'm not okay with this. And he goes that you will find me uh, that you'll find me to be very quick in responding to you and helping you. But he goes, I have a problem. Famada asna. What should I do though? Innama ana rajulun wahid. I'm only one man. He said, Waqad wajatta lakathaniyan. He said, Man, qala ana. So he said, Abghina thalithan. Qala qad fa'altu. Qala man huwa? Qala Zuhair bin Abi Umayya. So Mut'im sends says, I need a second person to stand with me in this cause. He goes, you have a second person, that's me. He goes, well, we need to find a third. He goes, I've already arranged. He goes, who? He goes, Zuhair. So he goes, we got three very influential people now. He says, but we still need to go and find a fourth person to stand with us. So they go to Abu Bukhtari. Abu Bukhtari is the man that I, I, I mentioned in the narration who was sneaking stuff into Khadija radiallahu anha. He was taking things to Khadija radiallahu anha and he was supporting basically the smuggling of goods into you know, the, the boycott and the valley at that time. So they go to him knowing that he had a soft spot and he wasn't okay with this situation. They have the same conversation. He says, I'm with you. He goes, but we need a fifth person. So they go to Zama bin al-Aswad, who is the father of Sauda. Sauda radiallahu anha, who would later on be the second wife of the Prophet ﷺ after the passing of Khadija, the Prophet ﷺ would marry her. Her father, who was also a very good, decent man, they go to him, Zama'a, and they say the same thing. فَكَلَّمَهُ وَذَكَرَ لَهُ قَرَابَتَهُمْ وَحَقَّهُمْ He talked to him like, look, we're related to these people. How can we treat people like this? What's wrong with us today? And he joins them as well. So then they basically decide that we need to gather together in the evening at night. And we need to basically make a show, we may need to make a stand, we need to put a little protest together. So they go there to the haram, Zuhair is the one who's decided to speak on behalf of the group. He does tawaf, and when finishing tawaf, then basically he addresses the people of Mecca. And that's basically where the whole protest happens. Abu Talib comes at that time, Abu Talib sees the situation, he speaks out as well. Then the Prophet ﷺ told Abu Talib about the, um, the scroll being eaten away at by the bugs, and then he points that out. And then at that time, um, you know, the whole boycott basically ends. But I wanted to add some of the details that you actually see people who did not accept Islam. People who just were not, who were not Muslim at that time. But these were people who wouldn't even go on to accept Islam. Not only were these people not Muslim at that particular time, they went on to not accept Islam. But you find these people not only voicing their support, well you could say that okay, if a huge tragedy is occurring, an atrocity like this, and they're witnessing it, and they're kind of put on the spot, then of course they'll say, yeah, this is bad, we shouldn't do this. But that's not the case here. These people are campaigning. They're petitioning one another. They're putting a group together. They're putting a protest and a petition together. Why to alleviate the suffering of the Muslims of that time? And so it's a very interesting observation from the life, from the seerah, of the Prophet ﷺ. Now when we basically move on uh, further into the aftermath of these events, we talked a little bit about it last week, how the Prophet ﷺ had to basically try to kind of settle back into the environment that was present at that time. But we also find something else very interesting. One of the incidents that I mentioned um, earlier in our discussion on the seerah, and that was when the Prophet of Allah wasallam recited Surah Al-Najm um, in the Haram, in, near the Kaaba. And when he reached the final verse, the final ayah, فَاسْجُدُوا لِلَّهِ وَعْبُدُوا Prostrate before Allah and worship only Him. Then I talked about how 
all the people that were there present in the haram, Muslim, non-Muslim, like everybody fell into sujood with the Prophet ﷺ. And that sent a rumor like wildfire over to even Abyssinia, East Africa. And the rumor, you know how rumors are by the time it reached there, the rumor basically was all of Makkah has become Muslim. And many of them came returning back. Some of the historians, some of the scholars of Sirah say that that return of many of the people from Abyssinia actually took place at this time now. After the boycott was over. So there, there is some contention amongst the scholars of Sirah that this return from Abyssinia actually occurred after the exit from the boycott, the three years of boycott. So if we place it par- here particularly, then there's a couple of more very interesting things that occur at this time. So a good group of people, a decent number of them, actually returns back from Abyssinia, arrives back in Mecca, only to find the situation, and I mentioned previously that they actually stopped a little bit outside of Mecca, and then they basically realized what the truth of the matter was, and many of them head straight back from there, some of them came back into Mecca. Those who came back into Mecca were now, de- were now dealt with the harsh reality of things being um, as dangerous as ever in Mecca for a believer. That the, the opposition, the Quraysh was more fierce and more violent than ever before. So now they were dealing with these very difficult circumstances. So we again find here a very interesting trend. The trend that we find here is, there was a system that was in place at that time, that was respected, even in that society and culture. And that was that if a respectable man, if a person of some level of respect and dignity and honor, would grant his protection to someone, then that person would be safe from any type of persecution or any type of violence. That person would receive protection and that person's protection for the sake of that other person would be respected. This was a system, this was part of their culture in Mecca at that time. So many of these believers who came back and decided to settle, decided to settle down in Mecca at that time, they basically now were looking for some type of protection. One of them that's mentioned is Uthman bin Mad'un. Uthman bin Mad'un radiallahu ta'ala anhu is one of the early companions of the Prophet sallallahu And he basically was looking for some type of protection um, to be able to reside in Mecca, but still be safe and to be protected. So it's mentioned in the narrations that he went to Al-Walid bin Mughira. He goes to Walid bin Mughira and he basically seeks out his protection. Even though Walid bin Mughira, remember, is very, he's very aggressive in his opposition towards the Prophet ﷺ. Oftentimes when they've come to debate, when they've come to argue, when they've gone to Abu Talib to make all types of ridiculous demands and, and, uh, you know, propositions, Walid bin Mughira oftentimes has been the mouthpiece. He's been the spokesperson. He's the one who speaks on the behalf of the people of Mecca. So Walid bin Mughira is no friend to the Muslims by any means. But at the same time, Uthman bin Mad'un, because of being again, having some relation, and being from a respectable family, Walid bin Mughira grants him his protection. And so therefore, because of that, nobody touches Uthman bin Mad'un. But the story goes on to mention that Uthman bin Mad'un radiallahu anhu, goes around, walks around in Mecca, safe and sound, and the other thing is, whenever you would grant someone your protection like that, the procedure was, you would go to the Kaaba, you would go to the Haram, and there you would address everyone, get everyone's attention and say, everyone listen up, this man is in my protection. And violating this person's safety and security will be an insult, a direct insult to me personally. And will, de- will be dealt with accordingly. So it's a public declaration. And so Uthman bin Mazarun radiallahu anhu is now walking around Mecca, seeing many other sahaba radiallahu anhum, you know, in great trial, test and trial. They're being tortured, persecuted, killed, they're dealing with all types of things. Uthman bin Mazarun radiallahu ta'ala anhu says to himself at that time, Wallahi inna ghudui wa rawahi aminan, fi jiwari rajuli min ahli shirk. وأصحابي وأهل ديني يلقون من البلاء والأذى في الله ما لا يصيبني. He says that I swear by God, my mornings and my evenings are safe and sound. 
in the protection of a man who's from the people of shirk. While my companions and the people who follow my religion, who follow the same religion, my brothers and sisters in faith, they are dealing with you know, great test and trial, and are being persecuted and tortured that I am not afflicted with. And he says, لَنَقْصٌ كَثِيرٌ فِي نَفْسِي I find this to be a problem with me personally. That I can live, I can go by, I can feel great and awesome that I, hey, at least I'm good. At least I'm good. While everybody else suffers and that doesn't trouble me or bother me. So he goes to Walid bin Mughira and he says, Ya Aba Abd Shams, that was his nickname. He says, Wafat dhimma tuka wa qad ragatu ilayya jiwarak. He said, you have done what you promised, but now I return your protection back to you. I'm no longer in need of it. He says, lima yabna akhi. He goes, why? Because again, they're related. So he goes, why my cousin? Why would you do that? Or my nephew? He says, la'allahu adaka ahadu min qawmi. He goes, did somebody mess with you? Did somebody mess with you? Even though I've, told, I've declared that you're protected by me? He goes, absolutely not. But I am, walakinni arda bi jiwari lahi azza wa jal. وَلَا أُرِيدُ أَنْ أَسْتَجِيرَ بِغَيْرِهِ I am satisfied with the protection of Allah, and I don't need anyone else's protection. So then, Al-Walid bin Mughira, because at the end of the day, remember, you know, he doesn't have anything emotionally or spiritually vested into the situation. He goes, go to the masjid, the Baytullah, the Haram, the Kaaba, go there, and over there publicly return my protection back to me, just like I publicly extended it to you. That's how this works. So he goes there, Uthman bin Maz'un, goes, walks into the haram, addresses everyone, and says that I return Walid's protection back to him because I don't need anyone else's protection other than Allah. At this point in time, Labid bin Rabi'a is sitting there. Labid was... Um, a poet, a great poet of that time, he's sitting there and when he hears Uthman bin Mad'un take such a huge step, he says, Labid says, Ala kullu shay'in ma khalallahu batilu. He goes, look, look at this man, everything other than Allah, everything aside Allah is false. Allah is the only truth. And then he goes on to say, so Uthman says, Sadaqt, you've spoken the truth. So we see that Uthman bin Maz'un even through this courageous act inspiring other people. But then Labid goes on to say, وَكُلُّ نَعِيمٍ لَا مَحَالَ تَزَائِلُ He goes, and every blessing will end one day. So there Uthman bin Maz'un رضي الله عنه corrects him, he goes, كَذَبْتَ نَعِيمُ الْجَنَّةِ لَا يَزُولُ He goes, no, 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 you've made a mistake now. Because the blessings of paradise will never end. So Labid, he's a great poet, he's insulted by this. He goes, Ya ma'ashara Quraysh, Wallahi ma kana yu'addi jalisukum, ma kana yu'adha jalisukum, fa mata hadatha hadha fikum. He goes that this, this companion of yours, talking about himself in the third person, because he's a poet, right? So he's got a little bit of arrogance, he's a celebrity. So he goes, this, this uh, esteemed companion of yours, talking about himself, has never been insulted in this way before. What has happened to you people that a, that a celebrity like me can come here and is corrected and insulted here today? And so the narration basically goes on to say, and he goes on to kind of, uh, another person stands up and he goes, ha, إِنَّ هَذَا سَفِي فِي سُفَهَاءِ مَعَهُ he goes, this is a very foolish man, and he, he keeps company with other foolish people. قَدْفَارَقُوا دِينَنَا They've abandoned our religion. فَلَا تَجِدَنَّ فِي نَفْسِكَ مِنْ قَوْلِهِ He goes that, don't mind anything this man has to say. Uthman bin Maz'un retorts, he responds, and he goes, what did I say wrong? And he kind of answers back, until the thing becomes kind of heated. So another man basically stands up and strikes Uthman bin Maz'un on the face. So much so that he damages his eye. Now, the narration just kind of mentions that he damages his eye, whether he actually ruptures the eye or just gives him a black eye or whatever it is, but he seriously injures his face. Walid bin Mughira is standing there watching the whole thing. Remember whose protection Uthman bin Mad'un used to be in. He's watching the whole thing, and he walks up to him, and he says that, look at you. Your eye would have still been okay if you would have stayed in my protection. 
I would have protected you. You could have stayed in my protection and your eye would have been okay. He says that, Uthman responds to him and says, بَلْ وَاللَّهِ إِنَّ عَيْنِي أَصَّحِيهَا لَفَقِيرَةٌ إِلَى مِثْلِ مَا أَصَابَ أُخْتَهَا فِي اللَّهِ He goes, rather my other eye that is still alright, needs to be injured in the same way my other eye was injured. If it's done for the sake of Allah, then it's completely worth it. He said, for the sake of Allah, I'm just waiting for my other eye to get injured as well. This is worth the sacrifice. And he said, وَإِنِّي لَفِي جِوَارِ مَنْ هُوَ أَعَزُّ مِنْكَ وَأَقْدَرُ He goes, because now I am in the protection of someone who is more powerful than you, more capable than you, and more dominant than you will ever be. Ya Aba Abd Shams. Oh, uh, Wali bin Mughira, I am now in the protection of Allah, which is much more profound than you can ever imagine. And then Walid still persists. He goes, Halumma yabna akhi, in shi'ta ila jiwarik fa'ud. He goes, listen still, O nephew, if you still want my protection, I'll give it to you. He goes, no, I don't need your protection. So we see that this was a very difficult situation many of them were dealing with. There's still another narration that Abu Salama, Abu Salama and Ummu Salama, remember, they were amongst the early people who had migrated to Abyssinia. They also returned back and came back to Mecca. Abu Salama went to Abu Talib, the uncle of the Prophet ﷺ, and sought out, sought out his protection. He said, Abu Talib, can I have your protection? And he said, absolutely, you are most definitely in my protection. And when somebody found out, when some of the people from Banu Makhzum, who were the people that Abu Salama belonged to, when they found out that Abu Talib had granted him his protection, they came to Abu Talib and they said, Ya Abu Talib, هَذَا مَنَعْتَ مِنَّا إِبْنَ أَخِيكَ مُحَمَّدًا فَمَا لَكَ وَلِصَاحِبِنَا تَمْنَعُهُ مِنَّا He goes, look Abu Talib, you have protected and stopped us from laying a hand on your nephew Muhammad. That's understandable. He's your blood, he's your people. So you've protected him and haven't allowed, him, allowed us to lay a hand on him. We understand that. We can rationalize that. But what's the deal with you granting protection to somebody who belongs to our family, one of our people? Let us deal with him the way we need to deal with him. He abandoned our religion. He ran away from here. He's been a fugitive. Now he's come back. Let us deal with him. This ain't none of your business. This doesn't concern you. Let us take care of our, our own internal affairs. What have you done? So, Abu Talib says to them, إِنَّهُ إِسْتَجَارَ بِي وَهُوَ إِبْنُ أُخْتِي He goes, listen, number one, he asked for my protection. I'm a man of honor. He asked for my protection, I granted it to him. Secondly, he says, look, we do have an extended relation. He is the son of my sister. Which basically he's saying that, it's a way of saying, يَبْنَ أَخِي Saying somebody is someone's nephew from the brother's side, O oh son of my brother, is a way of saying you are very closely related to me. You are the son of my sister, is another figurative expression saying somebody has a distant relation. He goes, no, he is distantly related to me. Number two, he asked for my protection, and I granted it to him. in ana lam amna ibn ukhti, lam amna ibn akhi. He goes, and if I wasn't going to grant him my protection, then what's to say I would no longer protect my own nephew Muhammad? I'd no longer be a man of any type of honor. No dignity, no honor. So I, I'm sorry, I have to do what I have to do. Now when Abu Talib is actually having to defend himself, and you have to understand how bizarre this situation is. Remember, keep in mind, things in Makkah are very heated, things in Makkah are very bad. Abu Talib, yes, has just suffered through three years of isolation and boycott. But Abu Talib is still considered a leader in the, pe- in the eyes of the people of Makkah. In the eyes of Makkah, in the eyes of Arabia, he's still a great leader. And now you have these people here arguing with Abu Talib. And though that's, that's very out of character for a lot of these people. Abu Lahab is sitting nearby. Now remember who Abu Lahab is. Abu Lahab's a great villain. We've talked a lot about him. Abu Lahab actually speaks up and he says, Ya ma'ashar Quraysh. He goes, O people of Quraysh, لَقَدَ أَكْثَرْتُ مَعَلَى هَذَا الشَّيْخِ He goes, this elderly gentleman, this statesman, Abu Talib, y'all have caused enough trouble to him for today. You've exhausted him. That's enough. Basically, he's saying, 
That's enough. That's enough. Y'all have said it. All you needed to say. And he goes on to say, مَا تَزَالُونَ تَتَوَاثَبُونَ عَلَيْهِ فِي جِوَارِهِ مِنْ بَيْنِ قَوْمِهِ He goes, what's wrong with y'all? Why do you keep attacking him? Why do you keep coming at him? And attacking him and jumping on him because he grants protection to somebody who belongs to his people? What do you think a leader is supposed to do? A leader protects his people. Somebody from his people has come to him for protection, he's granted him protection. And you people keep coming at him like this? So he says, Wallahi, لَتَنْتَهُنَّ أَوْ لَنَقُومَنَّ مَعَهُ فِي كُلِّ مَا قَامَ فِيهِ حَتَّى يَبْلُغَ مَا أَرَادَ He goes, you people will stop now. Y'all will stop this now. Or all of us. And all of us is a huge statement on behalf of Abu Lahab. Because what he means by saying all of us is, even those of us who are opposed, the opposition. Hey look, I ain't been with my brother Abu Talib and my nephew Muhammad since the very beginning of this thing. I don't like this. But at the same time, y'all are getting a little out of line right now. And so y'all will stop this or we will stand with Abu Talib in everything that he stands for. فِي كُلِّ مَا قَامَ فِيهِ We will stand with him not only in this matter, but we will stand with him for in, in regards to everything that he stands for. Until what he wants to happen, ends up happening. So you think twice about this. You go home and you chew on that for a little bit. Now those people obviously, they were already arguing with Abu Talib, but Abu Talib is a very gentle soul. But now Abu Lahab, a very fierce-tongued man, and somebody who's always usually in the opposition, is now rebuking them, reprimanding them. So they are, they're back on their heels and they go about their way. Abu Talib however is sitting there, you know, you can imagine, kind of looking through the corner of his eye thinking, this is interesting. This is interesting. So the narration says, Abu Talib says, Abu Talib thinks to himself, that, you know, May, uh, it actually, they even mention, بَلْ نَنْصَرِفُ عَمَّا تَكْرَهُ يَا أَبَا عُتْبَى They basically say, don't worry Abu Lahab, we didn't mean to offend you, we'll leave now. And, وَكَانَ لَهُمْ وَلِيًّا وَنَاصِرًا عَلَى رَسُولِ اللَّهِ صلى الله عليه وسلم فَأَبْقَوْا عَلَى ذَلِكَ So, because Abu Lahab had always been against the Prophet ﷺ and they wanted to keep things that way, فَطَمِعَ فِيهِ أَبُ طَالِبْ حِينَ سَمِعَهُ يَقُولُ مَا يَقُولُ now Abu Talib is thinking, this is very interesting. Could Abu Lahab kind of be making his way over to the side after everything that's happened? أَن يَقُومَ مَعَهُ فِي شَأْنِ رَسُولِ اللَّهِ That even if he doesn't want to accept the religion of Muhammad, maybe he's now willing to stand up and defend Muhammad. Maybe. So the narration actually mentions that Abu Talib encourages Abu Lahab at this particular time to support the Prophet ﷺ in his cause. And to protect him. And he recites some poetry to him. He goes, وَإِنَّ إِمْرَأً أَبُ عُتَيْبَ عَمُّهُ لَفِي رَوْضَةِ مَا إِنْ يُسَامُ الْمَظَالِمَ He goes on to basically recite some poetry to him where he basically is saying that, look, there is a man, O oh, Abu Utba, uh, that you are his uncle. And he stands alone facing all these different types of oppression and, and opposition. That will now this be the time that you will come to the aid and to the help of your own family? But then of course Abu Lahab basically tells him, he goes, whoa, whoa, take it easy there. I just didn't like them talking to you like that because they talk to you today like that, tomorrow they talk to me like that. So Abu Lahab goes about his way, but it's still a very interesting environment. That I, what I want to illustrate more than anything else is that I want, I, I want everyone to understand how in in negating the boycott, basically ending the boycott, you have non-Muslims, people who do not believe, did not end up believing, did not ever believe. You have them petitioning and campaigning to end the boycott. You have non-Muslims, people who did not end up ever believing, they didn't take their shahada, didn't accept Islam, till the end of their life. You have them granting protection to believers, because of what's going on in Mecca and willing to grant them protection. The last incident that I want to mention here, that is also very interesting in this regard is, 
At this point in time, after the boycott ended, so you have to kind of understand what's happened in Makkah so far. What's happened in Makkah is, you know, just kind of to kind of browse through, to kind of illustrate, so you can appreciate how fatigued, how exhausted somebody would be. Again, this is the tragedy. The tragedy is that we sit here in an, you know, in a temperature controlled room on soft carpet, talking about very casually the suffering of the Sahaba in Mecca. I realize this is still a blessing and alhamdulillah at some level we're engaging in the discussion on the seerah, but we have to be cognizant of that fact. That do, are we truly appreciating their sacrifice? Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu accepted Islam on the very, the second day of Nubuwa of prophethood. Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu, look what he's been through. All the early days of hiding out in secret and reaching out to people and slowly growing the numbers while ever being rep, you know, very cautious and apprehensive. Then eventually when the message goes public, Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu coming to the aid and the defense of the Prophet only to be beaten into a coma. And literally receiving, we talked about in the narration, receiving you know, permanent scars and permanent damage even to his face. To then witnessing the brutal murder and killing and torture of innocent people all throughout Mecca. To then having to say farewell and goodbye to friends, brothers, sisters, family members, community members, brothers and sisters in faith, and see them leave and depart off to a faraway land. Then to only turn around and then to spend three years in isolation and boycott. Having to bury babies. Watching mothers born, mourn the death of their infants. I mean just imagine how, how much a person can take. The heartache that he's been through. What he's seen, what he's been through. What he's witnessed. And, and try to imagine if, you know, you, you know, how difficult it would be for someone. That you just don't wake up in the morning and just sort of brush off it. He's a human being. He's a very soft-hearted man. So finally, Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala anhu, with a very heavy heart, tears in his eyes, a heavy heart, he goes to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and he asks the Prophet ﷺ for permission to also go and join the Sahaba in East Africa, in Abyssinia. The Prophet ﷺ, again, obviously, with a heavy heart, gives him permission. Because he realizes, nobody has stood firmer and stronger than Abu Bakr has. But at the same time, he realizes what he's been through. So the Prophet ﷺ gives him permission. Go ahead, you can go. Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu packs up his stuff, leaves Makkah. The narration says that he's actually traveled a day or two outside of Makkah. When he runs into a man by the name of Ibn Ad-Daghina. Ibn Ad-Daghina. Whose name is, uh, who belonged to the tribe of Banu Kinana. His name is a couple of different narrations. Some Al-Waqidi mentions his name as Al-Harith, and a suhaili mentions that his name was Malik. In either case, he was more popularly known as Abu Daghina, or excuse me, Ibn Daghina, Ibn Daghina, and he belongs to Banu Kinana. Banu Kinana were Hulafa. They were basically brothers through treaty and alliance with the Quraysh, with Banu Hashim. So that means that he was a leader of his people, and his people had a pact in an agreement with the Quraysh. So therefore, Ibn Daghina was a man with some influence in Mecca. Because they didn't want to violate that pact. Because these were, Banu Kinana was a huge powerful tribe. And this was a source of alliance and strength for both of them, both tribes. And so if, if Ibn Daghina is a leader of his people, his word is, is very respected and accepted. He runs into Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu, sees him with his stuff, and he says, where are you going? إِلَىٰ أَيْنَ يَا أَبَا بَكْرَ Where do you think you're going? He knew Abu Bakr, a, 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 a very respectable man from Quraysh. He goes, where are you going? He says, أَخْرَجَنِي قَوْمِ He says, my people left no choice but for me to leave. My people forced me out. They made me leave. Meaning the conditions, the situations. وَآذُونِي 
I've, I've received great harm from my own people. وَضَيِّقُوا alayya, And they've made life there very difficult for me. So I have no choice but to leave. So Ibn Daghina hearing this is shocked. He goes, Lima, how, could, how is this even possible? He go, and then he goes on to say, فَوَاللَّهِ إِنَّكَ لَتَزِينُ الْعَشِيرَةِ he goes, you are somebody who respects family. وَتُعِينُ عَلَى nawa'ib. You help in all types of good causes. وَتَفْعَلُ الْمَعْرُوفِ وَتَكْسِبُ الْمَعْدُونِ He goes, you do good things for society. You earn for those people who can't earn for themselves. He says, إِرَجَعْ فَإِنَّكَ فِي جِوَارِ He goes, let's head back. You are in my protection now. Another narration even mentions... So I'll talk about that at that particular time. So he goes that you come with me, you're in my protection now. And one thing that's very interesting here as an observation is what Ibn Daghina says to Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu about Abu Bakr is very similar to what Khadija radiallahu anha said to the Prophet wasallam when the Prophet wasallam told her about receiving revelation and being very overwhelmed by this and being worried about how people would receive this and whether people would just, you know, even tolerate this or not. Khadija radiallahu anha said the same thing to the Prophet wasallam that you are somebody who is so valuable to his society, his community, so beneficial to his people. That how could Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ever let you just go to waste like that? Similarly here, Ibn Daghina says to Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu, No, 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 you're a very good person. We can't lose people like you. Come on, you're in my protection, let's go. So they come back to Mecca. Ibn Daghina enters into the haram, takes Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu, takes him by the hand, and takes him into the haram. And then actually addresses the people, and he says to them, "Inna Abu Bakr la yu, la yakhruju mithlahu wa la yukhraj. A man like Abu Bakr cannot be allowed to leave, let alone be ousted from where he lives. A man of the caliber and the character of Abu Bakr, a man who is such a source of benefit for his community, should never be allowed to leave. He's an asset to his community, let alone be ousted by his own people." Then he says to them, he reprimands the people of the leaders of Quraysh. He goes, أَتَخْرُجُونَ رَجُلًا يَكْسِبُ الْمَعْدُومِ Are you telling me that you guys are kicking out from your city, from your community, a man who will go and earn on behalf of people who don't have anything? وَيَصِلُ rahim, He respects family. وَيَحْمِلُ kal, He carries and lifts those people who can't lift themselves. وَيَقْرِ ضَيْف He honors and dignifies his guest. وَيُعِينُ عَلَى نَوَائِبِ الْحَقِّ and he helps in the cause and the aid of truth. So then, he says, to announces to the people of Mecca, that from this day forth, he says, يَا مَعْشَرَ قُرَيْشِ إِنِّي قَدَ أَجَرْتُ إِبْنَ أَبِي قُحَافَ I have granted my protection to the son of Abu Quhafa, Abu Bakr. فَلَا يَعْرِضْ لَهُ أَحَدٌ إِلَّا بِخَيْرٍ Nobody should approach Abu Bakr unless they have good intentions. Nobody is to approach Abu Bakr with any type of bad intentions. فَكُفُوا عَنْهُ فَكُفُوا عَنْهُ Everybody hands off when it comes to Abu Bakr. Nobody lay a, fa- lay a finger on Abu Bakr. Now, the narration goes on to say that Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu goes back home, settles back in, he's very relieved. He's very relieved. Because deep down inside, he didn't want to leave Makkah. For no other reason than Muhammad Rasulullah is in Mecca. And we know from the life of Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu, nothing was dearer to him than the Prophet ﷺ. The Prophet ﷺ says, think about Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam saying about a man, I have paid everybody back, but I can never pay Abu Bakr back for what he did for me. Allah will have to pay him back on my behalf. Think about Muhammad Rasulullah saying that about a man. Think about the quality and the caliber, think about the khayr of a person about whom the Prophet ﷺ says that if I was not the Khalil of Allah, if I wasn't best friends with Allah, then I would have most definitely, without a doubt, let takhatu Abu Bakr and Khalila. I would have taken Abu Bakr to be my very best friend. Think about that man, what that means. So Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu deep down inside wanted to be able to stay in Makkah and just kind of looking for an excuse. So now that Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu comes back and settles back in, 
he goes to his home, and Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu was a very devout person. So we hear about the activism of Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu, the social services of Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu through the testimony of Ibn Daghina. But Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu is the ultimate role model because he balances his social and community activism and social services along with, along with spirituality and prayer and worship and ibadah and dhikr and tilawa. So Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu had a daily ritual that not only just in the night, particularly during the night, but even throughout the day, he had times of the day, times of the night where he would pray. He would make salah and he would recite the Qur'an within his salah. And it said about Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu, that kana rajulan araq, or kana rajulan raqqan, that, or riqan. He was a man who was very soft-hearted. He was a very, very soft-hearted man. And so when he would recite the Qur'an, when he would pray, he not only himself would cry, but he would recite the Qur'an in such a way, he would make dua in such a way, in the night, that it would make somebody else cry. Just witnessing it, just listening to it. And, so, and Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu used to like to pray right outside of his home, kind of like on the porch. On the porch of his home, he used to like to pray out there, just to be able to be outdoors and just experience the weather and just kind of enjoy his prayer. And it said that what ended up happening was men, and especially women and children, would kind of gather around whenever he would start to pray and would listen. And they would cry. The leaders of Quraysh started to see this and they, got very bo- they were troubled by this, they were bothered by this. And he said, this is a huge problem, what are we gonna do about this? He's gonna, he's gonna, you know, cause all, put all types of ideas. He's gonna have an effect on our women and children. So, but they know at the same time they can't really lay a finger on Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu anymore because of Ibn Daghina. So they go to Ibn Daghina and they say that, you know, did you give him your protection to be able to cause harm to us? Did you give him your protection to be able to cause harm to us? He says, what is he doing? He say, oh, he prays and he worships and he does all this stuff and he, he's causing a huge problem for us. Our women and children are all, you know, and, and our, our weak-minded are all gravitating towards him. So Ibn Daghina goes to Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu and he says, Ya Abu Bakr, inni lam ujirka li tu'zi qawmak wa qad karihu makanak alladhi anta bihi وَتَأَذَّوْ بِذَلِكَ مِنْكَ فَادْخُلْ بَيْتِكَ وَاصْنَعْ فِيهِ مَا مَا أَحْبَبْتَ He goes, Abu Bakr, I didn't give you my protection so that you would go and cause all types of harm to people. And you would, you know, make trouble for them and now they come to me complaining to me. He goes, why don't you just go into your home and you can do whatever it is that you want to do inside of your home. So there are two narrations. One narration actually says that Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu, one narration basically ends right there and Abu Bakr gives him the response. One narration says that Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu actually does go inside of his home or one narration actually mentions that he builds a little bit of an extension to his home. Like almost like a musalla, his own personal musalla, a place to pray. He built, constructs a little bit of an extension to his home and he prays in there. And the people still gather up outside of there. And they go back to Ibn Daghina and they complain again. And Ibn Daghina comes to Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu and says, you gotta stop this, you gotta put an end to this. Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu finally says to him, he says, well, instead of me putting an end to what I'm doing, how about, أَرُدُّ عَلَيْكَ جِوَارَكَ وَأَرْضَى بِجِوَارِ اللَّهِ I've caused you a lot of trouble, I appreciate your help, but I return your protection back to you. I'm sufficient and satisfied and happy with the protection of Allah alone. So he says, فَرْدُ دَ عَلَيْكَ جِوَارِي He says, رَدَتُهُ عَلَيْكَ He says, okay, then return my protection back to me. He goes, I returned it to you. And Ibn Daghina basically stands up amongst the people, and he says, يَا مَعَشْرَ قُرَيْشِ إِنَّ إِبْنَ أَبِي قُحَافَ قَدْ رَدَّ عَلَيَّ جِوَارِي فَشَأْنُكُمْ بِصَاحِبِكُمْ He says that the son of Abu Quhafa has returned my protection back to me. So therefore, you do with him whatever it is that you want to do with him. It's between y'all and it's between him now. I no longer play any type of a role in this. And that basically is 
what ended up happening in that situation. So this is a little bit of you know some of the events that followed after the the Prophet of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and the Sahaba, the believers, had come out of the boycott in the valley. And these are some of the incidents that happened at that time. But one of the key things that I wanted to illustrate is that the Muslims conducted themselves. They carried themselves. They remained in spite of being oppressed, tortured, uh, embattled. You know, in spite of all of that, they continued to be such a source of good and khayr and benefit that their benefit was undeniable in their own community to the extent that people who did not believe in Allah, did not accept Islam, did not like the Prophet Wasallam's mission and message, still felt obligated to support these people and protect these people and help these people. And that really is a testament to the akhlaq and the character, the teachings of the Prophet Wasallam, and also to how firmly the Sahaba held on to and how they practiced the character, the akhlaq of the Prophet ﷺ, and how they implemented what the Prophet ﷺ taught them, and they were a source of benefit to their own community and society. One that didn't agree with them, one that didn't even like them, one that, would, that was violent and aggressive towards them. That at the end of the day, they would still grant their support to them, and they would stand against, you know, taking things too far against these people. And that really goes to show you something. That really tells you a lot. And it shows us that our akhlaq and our character, our manners, the way we conduct ourselves, and the, the, the good that we bring to our community and our society, whether Muslim or non-Muslim, is the biggest statement of what we believe in. And it is the biggest proof about the validity and the benefit and the khair about, of what we believe in, and what we advocate and what we propagate. And it's very important to understand that. Um, uh, it said about Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu that after he left, you know, after he left the protection of Ibn Daghina, it said literally within the next couple of days, Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu leaves his home, he's going towards the Kaaba, towards the Haram. Uh, a young man, like a street, just like, like, like a thug from the streets in Mecca, walks up to Abu Bakr. And you have to understand who Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu is. Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu is a man who's 50 years old, a very respected man of his people used to be viewed as a leader of his people. This street thug from Mecca walks up to Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu, picks up a lot of dirt, picks up a bunch of dirt, and throws it on the head of Abu Bakr to insult him. Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu walks by with, you know, he's got all this dust and this dirt on him, this man, this boy walks up and this young man throws all this dirt on Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu's face and head. And he keeps on walking, he doesn't say anything to this young man. Walid bin Mughira and As bin Wa'il are sitting there watching this. Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu turns to them and he goes, Allah tara ma yasna'u hadha safi? Allah tara ma yasna'u hadha safi? He goes, do you see what this foolish young man does? How he disrespects his elders? And... They respond back by saying, "Anta fa'alta dalika binafsika ya Abu Bakr." They said, "No, no, no. This young man didn't do anything to you. You've done this to yourself, Abu Bakr. You've put yourself in this situation. You've done this to yourself." Abu Bakr radiAllahu anhu says to himself. He just kind of says at that time. He says, "A Rabbi, ma ahlamaka. A Rabbi, ma ahlamaka. A Rabbi, ma ahlamak." He says, "My Lord." How patient and forbearing are you with your slaves? My Lord, how patient and forbearing are you? My Lord, how patient and forbearing are you? Meaning that these people disrespect me. Somebody disrespects me and these people who are leaders, my peers, say that I deserve this disrespect and it's so enraging to me. I can't believe what I'm hearing. I can't stand what these people say and what they think. But my Lord, my Master, you're the one who created these people. You sustain these people. You provide for these people. And they disrespect you. They refuse to believe in you. How patient and forbearing you must be, Ya Rabb. I marvel at that. And I remind myself by means of that. To just, you know, ignore these people. Be patient with these people. 
and let you deal with these people. So we find that two things. Number one, like I mentioned previously, we learn from the Prophet ﷺ and the Sahaba radiallahu anhum that their character and their benefit to their people was so undeniable that even those who disagreed with them could not deny the fact that these people were, were of benefit to their communities. Number two, we see that through the most difficult of situations and circumstances, the way that the Sahaba, a great man like Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu, the way that he stayed patient and stuck to his values, was by turning to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. By reflecting on the greatness of Allah. By reflecting on how merciful and patient Allah is with His slaves. And by reminding himself of that, he's able to himself find some patience, find some, find some patience, some comfort and solace in that fact. We should all take this into account and reflect on this as well. Let's try to be a source of benefit to our communities. That's the greatest form of our da'wah. And number two, when we are still faced, when we are still dealt with, you know, negative, negativity, and um, aggression, in opposition, in hostility, then in those situations, again, we don't resort. We don't abandon our values. We don't lower ourselves to, that, to those people's level. We don't resort ourselves to those types of ta- tactics. Rather, what we do in that situation, is that we turn to Allah. We find patience, comfort, solace, tranquility with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And reflect on the greatness of Allah. If I feel disrespected, imagine Allah. Who created these people who say such vile things about Allah? Who disrespect Allah? Who disbelieve in Allah? Refuse to believe in Allah? And He still feeds them. He still feeds them. He still protects them. He still takes care of them. Think about how patient Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is. And try to find some, find some patience, some comfort, some forbearance, and some solace in that regard. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us all the ability to practice everything that's been said and heard. Subhanallah wa bihamdihi, subhanakallahum bihamdik, nashadu wa la ilaha illa anta, nasaghfirka wa natabu ilayk.